So you went into the service, and I understand yeah. that you were able to actually pursue music while you were in the By service. By a fluke, I created a job for myself uh, uh, as the, uh, the first composer in the newly formed documentary film squadron that the Air Force had begun and uh, persuaded the, the commanding officer uh, that he needed a composer to write original scores for his documentary films. And since he was <clears throat> kind of thought of himself as the Louis B. Mayor of the Air Force, uh, he was delighted. And so the only thing it was, it was a four-year hitch. But in those four years, I had the Air Force Symphony Orchestra at my disposal Everything I wrote, they played. So that's where I learned how to orchestrate. That's where I had to teach myself the craft of film composition because there was nobody to teach me. I, I think I had Frank Skinner's old book called Underscore. And that was, I learned everything from that. So that by the time I came out of the Air Force, I was a pretty experienced film composer and my life seemed somewhat predetermined. Um, in addition to that, I'd always loved film music um, since uh, the, the, the one film that really put me over the top with the conviction that this is what I wanted to do with my life was um, even before my venture, my ill-fated venture into medicine, uh, which never happened. But I remember when I first saw King's Row back in the early 40s, which is one of Korngold's most extraordinary scores. It's like an opera. It's really like an opera. It's constructed thematically. It's, it's dazzling uh, if you really listen to it. And I know every note of it. I saw the movie about 40 times. And uh, so um, uh, I, I really knew pretty much that it was, I was somehow going to be, end up in films. <laughs> All in all, I would say, I can remember one thing, that I would be working in my studio. I had a studio in a barn where we lived in the country, in the, just outside of New York. And uh, just watching these scenes on the little screen of the moviola, with the clackety-clack of the moviola going by, even then, it, the, the scenes were so powerful and they were so heart-wrenching that I remember sometimes I had to just shut the damn thing off and go out for a walk. I just couldn't live in that world anymore. I had to breathe. It was that, that intense. Um, and uh, I guess, I don't know how to say it. I, it's so hard to choose among, how can one choose among one's children? And yet, you know, if I had to lose every other film score I ever wrote, I think The Miracle Worker would be the one that remained. I really believe that there should be no music under any scene unless the scene can't do without it. Otherwise, it's just, it's just noise. It's just gilding the lily. And I've had to deal with, con with producers and directors who love that layer of oatmeal, you know, just always there, always there. And uh, I've always felt that music is so much more powerful after a period of silence, when suddenly its entrance has, has a real meaning, as well as its exit, when suddenly the silence takes over. That's just like another kind of music. Silence is its own kind of music. One interesting thing happened, that this was really a, a curiosity, it's never happened to me before, that um, before they shot the first scene of Peter O'Toole walking into the cathedral, they had used as a temp track the famous Dies Irae, the, the Gregorian chant for the dead, uh, sort of echoing through the cathedral as he walked through. Um, when it came time for me to score that scene, I decided to score it for orchestra using the Dies Irae as a kind of motif, uh, sort of woven through my, my version of it. Uh, when we uh, disc recorded that piece and, and 
had the playback in the control room, the music editor had forgotten to, as they say, flip the tape of the Tem track. In other words, suddenly we were hearing both my score and the Tem track at the same time. And he leaped and said, oh, I'm sorry, Larry, I didn't. And I said, stop, stop, don't move because it was unbelievably perfect. And we ended up having both, having the real Gregorian chant and the orchestra very subtly commenting on it. It was one of those accidents that you could never have calculated. I do remember one of the most interesting creative moments of my life. It's funny how you remember these things what is it, 30 years ago? And uh, we were about two and a half weeks away from recording the score, first, first day of recording, and I still didn't have the main theme. Could not find it. Was going absolutely crazy. I was living in a little house in Malibu on the water, and I just, I'd walk on the beach, I'd do everything I could think of, and I, I sat at the piano, I, I did, every kind of thing to try to find the right theme to represent this extraordinary idea of the English nobleman coming to live among the Northern Plain Indians. Well, one night I was lying on the sofa, I still remember it, in my, I was getting sick of this agony, but it was nonstop. So finally I decided You've got to get out of your emotions and get into your head. Now let's, let's, let's have some, some sense here. What does this theme need? And I thought, it needs essentially two things. It needs to have the entire result of hundreds of years of European high culture. This man was a cultivated Englishman who, who knew um, uh, Shakespeare and Horace and Racine and had heard the great music of, of, uh, of George Frederick Handel and all of that. He, he was a man of real culture. And here he comes and he is exposed to a completely foreign culture of the American, North American Indian. And somehow, how can I find a theme which will incorporate both of these elements. And finally I felt relieved. I said, okay, now you've at least made a kind of a concrete job for yourself. I walked over to the piano and 20 minutes later I stood up and had the theme. It was my head helping my heart, actually. It was really amazing. And because the theme has a sort of a kind of feeling of classical harmony, but there are certain elements of the interval of the falling fourth, which is so characteristic of all these Indian chants that I'd been listening to, but harmonized in a European way. And somehow the combination of the two just managed to work. I think it's one of the better themes that I've done in my life. How would you like to be remembered? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that's, that's the hardest question you've asked. Um, uh, I, I don't really... <clears throat> I would like to be able to be remembered uh, with some affection by my family. And uh, as far as all the people who have never met me, um, I would just like to be remembered as someone who um, did his best to write music that was communicative, that would really touch people's hearts.